So anyway, without further ado, let me launch into today's topic, which is towards a green economy. Well, firstly, this uh, I'd be surprised, and I won't ask for a show of hands, if anyone would have not heard of the green economy, because the word green economy has been in the air for the last 20 years. And indeed, there have been different definitions of this, but the way that my team and I at the United Nations Environment Program decided to call it would be to say that there are really four buttons that you need to press in order for an economy to be a great economy. Number one, human well-being has to be increasing. Why would you not want it to? Number two, social equity has to be increasing, which means that the gap between the rich and the poor has to reduce, and that doesn't mean making everyone rich poor, it means making everyone poor less poor, hopefully even a bit rich. The third is that ecological scarcities have to be declining, which means that we should not be worried, as we are right now, about whether India, for example, over the next 20 years is going to have a gap between supply and demand of water of almost 50%, or China, another 25%. We should not have to worry about whether the quality of soils is good enough to be able to support agriculture in sub-Saharan Africa. So ecological scarcities have to be declining and not increasing as they are right now. And the fourth point is that environmental risks have to be declining, which means, among other things, climate change risks have to be going down and not up as they are right now. So these are the four buttons, if you like, that you need to press, or the four boxes that you have to tick in order for an economy to be called a green economy. Now, if you pause for a bit and think, all right, so how many of you would like an economy which doesn't tick those four boxes, which means that your well-being goes down, poverty increases, ecological scarcities get worse, and environmental risks get bigger? Please raise your hands. <laughs> in other words, what you, ladies and gentlemen, are saying, that you want a green economy, and that's common sense. Why wouldn't you? This is the only sensible kind of economy that you would have. And yet, and yet, that's exactly the economy that you do not have. Because today, even though human well-being is increasing a bit, it's not on average. Social equity is not going up. It's in fact, in most parts of the world, going down. We are seeing bigger gaps due to unemployment between the rich and the poor. We are seeing riots in London, for example. That's not exactly a back of the beyond jungle. We are seeing riots in London, where the rioters are running away not with food, but with consumer goods. They are running away with branded goods because they are being taught, they are being trained to think brands. So it's consumerism that is driving those riots. They don't have the jobs to buy what they are being told by advertising to buy. Unfortunately, it is consumerism without the cash. And it's a complex kind of consumerism when you don't have the money to express it. So we are in a situation where we are seeing dissatisfaction. And of course, ecological scarcities are going up. We know that. There is a lot of water shortage already around the world, and there certainly is a decline in soil productivity. And uh, I think everyone knows that the environmental risks are increasing, mainly because of climate change, but also because we haven't really addressed some of the other risks in terms of pollution, chemical pollutants, and hazards coming from there. So, ladies and gentlemen, despite all of you wanting a green economy, we don't have one. And in fact, very few people would actually want a brown economy, other than those with particular uh, perspectives and vested interests in the profits of the brown economy. Now, there are different terms and definitions, and there's, an, in fact, a, a veritable jungle of definitions. There's green growth, which came partly from Korea and, and China and from, uh, from other UN organizations. Uh, there's also inclusive wealth, which is an old uh, concept in terms of Let's take the total assets, human capital, natural capital, physical capital, let's take all the assets that there are in a country, divide by the number of people. And so long as the average of all these assets, that is inclusive wealth, is increasing, that means the economy is doing well. But these calculations are tough, and Pastor Laskofta, who's a great economist, and his, his colleagues have written about this, and they've even started some work, but people don't use this metric. People still use GDP, which is basically the flow of goods and services. That's what's measured. And finally, and off late, or very recently, commissioned by the French government. Um, and there's a story, actually, as to why it was commissioned by the French government instead of GDP. A lot of this came about because of a recognition that using GDP as a measure of performance, gross domestic product, is like a bit like saying that 
let's turn on the tap in the house and see how fast the water is flowing. And the faster it's flowing, the happier we are. Let's use that as our measure of performance, as in how fast does the water flow out of that tap. But of course, the water comes from the tank upstairs. You have to pay money for the water in the tank upstairs, and you're declining the level. So measuring the flow of water in the tap isn't a good performance or success. Maybe measuring the stock of water in the tank would be better. And that's the basic concept here. And apparently the reason why the French government decided to launch this exercise is because GDP growth in France had stopped. And they realized that GDP growth isn't clearly the answer. People are not unhappy because of lack of GDP growth or happy because of GDP growth. They are happy and unhappy for all kinds of other reasons, including the quality of wine they buy and whether or not the cheese tastes good and so on. So might as well do a proper study and understand what this whole thing is really about and then come up with an alternative measure which at least, if nothing else, explains where we are if it doesn't give us answers. So that was the interesting story behind this. But the, the fact is that Stiglitz and, and Amartya Sen have come up with an amazing good construct. Unfortunately, even though they've identified eight different factors, one of which is environmental, which ought to be measured in order to get a handle on well-being, the one that they don't measure is the environment. And the logic is rather silly. They just say that, well, you don't get market prices for this, so that, that's too difficult, too complicated. And I admire the effort, but I challenge that particular, particular conclusion. Because the whole point is that we have enough information, we have enough analysis, we have enough calculations in the TEAB report and in other work that's been done to give us the ability to measure environmental factors. And that's the way that we have to go. And finally, people often, often ask me this question. Hang on, but isn't this the same thing as sustainable development? Well, not quite. It is actually the means to the end. Development is sustainable and can be sustainable only if it's been achieved through the green economy. That's the whole point. So the green economy is actually the economic engine or the vehicle which will get you to sustainable development. It's not an alternative. It's not a substitute. It's a means to an end. That's what it is.